Hello mate, and how the bloody hell are ya? Welcome to In the Back of My Head podcast, episode 56. Oh, it's a, it's a weekly creative journal where I talk about creativity, whatever's in the back of my head. And I do hope that you get anything, anything out of it. Let's, uh, let's go. I've been musing over thinking about recently putting politics into art, putting politics into my art in particular, which is something that I have always flip-flopped on, not only about putting politics into my own art, but my enjoyment of political art. At the end of the day, truly, political art is my favourite kind of art. And I'm using political art in a very broad sense, but that's kind of the point of this video, which I'll get to. I do flip-flop on it because my main issue with it is when it gets, in my eyes, kind of preachy and uh, cheesy, and I would argue pointless. <laughs> my example is music. I think I think political music can be kind of hit and miss if you start putting like uh, figures, numbers, names, dates. They can be symbolic. But when your message would be better delivered as a podcast or as a pamphlet or as a speech at a rally, I don't know if the music's the right thing. The music's good for giving an emotional point of view. And again, broad brushes used here. I'm not saying that I, I'm not saying political songs that are going against what I just said shouldn't exist. By all means, by all means, because it hits a little certain a little cringe. It's a little cringe for me. I flip flop on it, but I've still come to the same realization that political art is always truly my favorite art. The art that sticks with me, the art that has completely built the foundation for who I am, especially politically, but just as a person, as a creator, as a as a human being. I thought we'd start with Star Wars Episode Four. <laughs> Everyone's favorite political satire. Is it a satire? Everyone's favorite political film. Do we think of it as such? I don't know. Look, Star Wars Episode 4 is uh, no secret, like, kind of based obviously on uh, westerns and samurai films. The dogfights are all based off, like, World War II footage. Those are the inspirations. And he's said all of that in interviews. I'm sure we all know that. And we also all know the story of Star Wars Episode 4. But let's do a quick recap, anyway. Just the foundational stuff. We're not going to get into later in the film, just the foundational stuff. Where we begin? Luke begins on Tatooine, a desert planet, dry. He hates sand, much like his father, which is a spoiler if you haven't seen it. <laughs> and I can relate. <clears throat> Fuck, I hate sand. I hate sand, I hate dust, I hate the dry heat. I love deserts visually. Deserts visually just are so appealing to me. Um, but then every other aspect. <laughs> He's living on Tatooine. He's in a terrible situation economically. He's in a terrible situation because he hates the sand. I don't know if he says he hates sand. I'm just assuming. I'm assuming that's passed down. It's genetic. And he wants to escape his life. Who hasn't been in such a situation? Growing up in a small country town that's maybe dying because the wool industry is all but dried up in that region, you know? Something like that. And you were like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta get out of here, go to the big smoke. Gotta get out and try and find me a better life. A very, very relatable tale. But then the Empire comes, dressed in grey white garb, reminiscent of certain uh, totalitarian uh, regimes. <laughs> and he burns, and they burn his family to a crisp. Which I think I didn't really like twig to that when I was a when I was a kid when I was a wee boy. I was just watching the film, and then when I rewatch it back as, a, as an older gentleman, <laughs> as a slightly taller boy, <laughs> and I'm like, oh shit, there's some charred corpses in Star Wars Episode Two, uh, Episode Four. This is always a romp. I remember this as a romp. I'm sorry, I thought we were here for a romp, and here's charred corpses. Unbelievable. Imagine uh, see, imagine uh, <laughs> assaulting a young lad with such imagery. My goodness. Star Wars Episode Four though was uh, based on the Vietnam War, and this is not a this is not a reach. This is not a stretch. 
This is said. He was he said this in 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 um in interviews. And you might already know this. So like if you know this, my apologies for fucking chewing your ear off for no reason. It was based off the Vietnam War. He was watching the Vietnam War on, on the TV, watching the news coverage, and he thought, "My God, this is awful. This is awful things that are happening." So the heroes of the story are based off uh, the Vietnamese, and then the Empire. Who could they represent? The Imperial Americans, the Yanks. It's not a perfect political film, nor does it want to be. Nor does it want to be. This is not. I don't. It would have been. Would have been a fucking train wreck, I imagine, if it went like really fucking on the nose about it. It's kind of delightfully dressed up, and I don't align with everything <laughs> that George Lucas says or believes. I'm sure uh, he gets a bad rap, but I, I I believe he's just actually a passionate filmmaker um, who then got a shitload of fucking money and maybe went a bit nuts. But in the end, he made good films, saved mostly in editing by his wife, you know. Godspeed to her. I don't believe in everything he says, or but he believes. I do believe that politics in art, generally speaking, makes for good art. The reason this came to mind is because I got into a conversation with a mate recently, and I'm sure we've all had uh, frustrating political conversations with mates. And this one was not about art, but I have had discussions in the past where I've had friends of mine say, "Hey, maybe don't put so much politics." Into your art. I thought that's insane to me. It's an insane thing to say. Why would you want that? Ah, oh, because art is an escape. Music, in particular, is an escape. Don't put so much politics into your art. But in this particular case, we're going around in circles. We're going around in circles about these two political issues that I, we don't need to uh, talk about in particular in this episode because it's not really important what they were. What is important was I was getting very heated, passionate. My heart was racing. I was pumped up, heated. It was a heated conversation. We ran and ran and ran in circles, and then he came out with the line, "Oh, I don't actually care, mate. I don't actually give a shit. Wait, oh, oh, I don't actually, <laughs> I don't actually care about this. Just so you know." And I found that very disarming, very dismissive, and it reminded me like that's some teenage bullshit. I did that. I did that. I've done that. I might still do it again. When someone when someone has a thing that they're really passionate about, when they're all heated up, and they're all like, oh, baby, blood's boiling, and they go, hey, nice thing that you care about. I'm just going to let you know real quick. I don't actually care. I don't care. Which is fine if they're not showing any interest at all. But then if they're really willing to rile you up, and then, hey, uh, I don't actually give a fuck, though. Hey, go fuck yourself. So dismissive. Disarming. I have said it in the past, I will speak on it once again. That in this day and age, anyone and everyone can make art. Your mum's got a mixtape. Your grandma's got a mixtape. Everyone's on YouTube, everyone's on Spotify. All in the same playing field, everyone can do it. The barrier of entry is so low. Besides, perhaps, economic barriers if you don't have time. Time is kind of the one barrier that we've still got. The tools are accessible, the platforms are accessible. Time is still elusive for many. Or not elusive, stolen from you. <laughs> you can see it, and then it's taken from you by certain powers that be. But anyone can make art, anyone can put it out there. And that's fantastic. And the technical quality of art is rising, I would say, because these tools are accessible. Tools that uh, would make the masters blush 20 years ago at what we can achieve. It's crazy what people can achieve in their bedrooms. And so then, what is the meaning? What is the purpose of the art? One that I really enjoy, one one purpose I really enjoy is just the the actual process, the meditative side of it, the, just the creating for the sake of creating, the just tap into your brain, let the ooze drip out and see what happens. Fantastic. But then if you're trying to put something out there with some sort of message, with some sort of point, with some sort of meaning, 
then it is the point of view, your point of view, which is the inherent meaning that adds the inherent meaning to the art. And so with that in mind, I would say that I don't know if I do this. I'm trying to get better at doing this. And this podcast is actually part of that goal, part of that that journey is to try and remind myself, teach myself to be as passionate as possible in just making art. Allowing myself to give a shit. Giving myself permission to give a shit. I think the best chance, the best chance, there's no guarantee, but the best chance to make good art is through uncompromised passion. That's not a radical idea, not a radical statement. A pretty fucking, that should be the, probably the first sentence in any textbook on how to make good art. <laughs> but uncompromised passion. How many of us have a, a record, a song, a piece of art, or something like that, that is on a technical level sh- shite? Not great, not good. But has, if it's a song, it could be mixed terribly, it could be recorded terribly, mastered terribly, even the performance itself could be kind of a bit, ugh. Maybe some of the lyrics, some of the singing is a little bit, ooh, not quite there, mate. But you can hear maybe their voice breaking, you can hear the passion, you can hear the heart bleeding, and that makes for good art. So if you want a point of view of the world, then you have to get political. It's unavoidable. It's unavoidable. You have to look at the world and think critically about it. Politics is not voting for this guy over this guy. Politics is not career politicians. Politics is a much broader idea. Politics is life. Politics is society. Politics is the world at large, is how it operates. It's people. It's how people interact with one another. That's politics. Because all of this can fall apart. A parliament, a system of operations, how it has gone for on forever, could all fall apart. If the idea of elections were completely done away with, and suddenly tomorrow in Australia, let's say, where we are, where I am, if they say in Australia, you know, we're done with all that, we're now in, uh, we're putting up uh, an emperor. We're doing an empire now. We have an emperor, that's what we're doing. That's still politics. It's a different format, but it's still the same thing. The, the, the politics is the organisation of human beings. At least in my books. I should probably have a definition up on screen, but I won't. <laughs> Australian politics is an interesting one, because Australian politics is dry, where America is very exciting. And I'm speaking of these two because I live in Australia and America is the dominant culture. But America is very exciting, it's a big show, it's a big opera, with fancy hair hair pieces and outfits and what have you, and big fireworks. And it's bad in all of its own ways, but it is exciting, and it gets people riled up. But here in Australia, I feel like we are taught as kids that it is boring, it is dry, it is drab. And I think that it is. There's a creator in Australia, and love and love or hate him, and I have a very mixed emotions about him, because he can be a right cunt. But friendly Geordies at least got people to give a shit about Australian politics. Uh, especially, I think during COVID, especially, he really blew up, um, showed off a lot of corruption that's happening in Australian politics. But generally speaking, politics in Australia is, we're run by, it's a country run by real estate agents. At least that's how it feels. It is smug, it is dry, it is drab, it is gray. And I think that's exactly how they like it. Because to give a shit about politics is almost unattractive in Australia. Maybe everywhere. And I had someone recently say to me, you're quite politically minded, aren't you? And I said, yes. And in my head, I didn't say it at the time, but now in retrospect, I feel, and so should all of us be. Because if you look out into the world and you have a point of view, you develop a point of view, then you should care. You should give a shit about life, about people, about the organization of society, about humanity. If you consider the idea of politics as just the organization of all of humanity, it's just how humans interact with one another, organize one another, then to not give a shit about that at all is just hyper-individual, hyper-individual culture, asterisks, (laughs) neoliberalism. 
that's avoiding the idea that we are a collective, regardless of what you want to think. That we are a collective. But this society prefers the idea of a, uh, a collection of main characters. <laughs> I think it's important, I think it's imperative to develop a worldview, to look at the way the world works, to look at society, look at humanity, how people are organized, and get a worldview and give a shit about it. I think to that line, art is my escape. Media is my escape. We all have our escapes. The place that we go to get away from it all. Once you get remotely older, in your 20s, 30s, 40s, what have you, you often go back to nostalgia as your place of escape. And that was kind of a, a jumping off point for this thing that's been rallying in the back of my head for the past few days, was watching a video on the channel This Exists, which has recently come back after a hiatus of a few years. Very excited because I love that channel. They talk about niche sections of the internet and why do they exist, how do they exist, yada yada. They were featuring another channel called Thought Slime on it. And they had this comment about nostalgia, which I thought was really interesting. Kind of a bit broader maybe than what we're talking about, but I'll try and bring it back. And the quote goes, Nostalgia has always been a cudgel of the right. It's a hallmark of the kind of proto-fascist narrative that there is this idealized past and that you've been humiliated and the enemy has taken it from you. In the past, it was used to describe historical events or wars or conflicts between nation states. But most of the people who are using this narrative now tend to come from countries that don't have a lot of grievances with other countries. They tend to be the most powerful countries that you know. America, Canada, the UK, I'll insert Australia into that. In places like that, you can't really blame your problems so much on an imposition by a foreign power. So you have to be a bit more creative with what exactly, have been ta- what exactly has been taken from you. And in this case of media, it seems to be, it seems to be the ability to consume media without thinking critically about it. When you really boil down these memes, what they are mad about, because in all these memes, you'll notice that the thing they are saying is that what they took from you, it hasn't actually gone away. What went away is the kind of attitude towards media that it's an uncritical good. Media that they had when they were children and that they've grown out of as adults. They fear it might complicate the happy memories. I thought that was really... (laughs) a profoundly nice little bow to tie up my grievances with these kind of arguments keep politics out of art because there is escapist art there is things that is just like a party song a love song a landscape painting isn't inherently political obviously but if you're watching something like star wars or listening to any music or poetry or reading a book be it like a sci-fi or a fantasy novel that is taking a look at the current state of the world in any way and I mean in the case of sci-fi or fantasy if it's parodying in any way I mean something like the new Fallout show that came out like a few months ago and there were people who were like quite frustrated um, at quote-unquote wokeism that ruined the show I mean like that is a that is an inherently stolen and meaningless term on the internet but like Fallout for its entire existence has been inherently political, deeply political. If your art in any way analyzes the world, not the physical world of rock and stone and trees and what have you, again, if you're painting a landscape painting, by all means, you don't need to wave a communist flag on that. (laughs) But if you're commenting on how humanity has organized itself, then your politics I think should be coming through. It is going to come through. Because your point of view is inherently entwined into the artwork. And to actually have a to actually create a good piece of art, to be passionate, I think demands of you to develop a strong opinion and worldview. One that should be malleable, one that should be ever evolving, of course. But the way that you see things, we all see through see things through a lens, obviously, right? If you have developed a way that you view the world, then that is going to reflect onto the artwork itself. So even if you are not being direct 
and saying like, oh, I believe this thing. Because you believe that thing, the way that you see the world, you will portray certain things in certain ways. Recently, people got really frustrated at the boys again. It was, uh, yeah, reactionary right conservatives for some reason and thought uh, Homelander was a cool guy. That show is very on the nose. That is borderline too on the nose for me about how anti-capitalist uh, and how anti-corporate um, and how anti-fascist it is. They're Nazis. Like, it's not... That's that's the, the Homelander sides with a Nazi. It's very black and white. <laughs> it's very direct. It's almost too much. I fucking love that show, though, goddamn. But for the fact that people didn't actually get it, they, they got through multiple seasons thinking, like, this is sick, and Homeland is kind of cool. What show are you watching, my dudes? If you're writing love songs, if you're writing party songs, if you're painting a, a landscape painting, sure, then you're political point of view might not come through but if you want to comment on the world if you want to comment on what is actually happening in front of you then you need to actually develop a strong sense of a world view the phrase like keep politics out of art is inherently escapism it means you get to escape it means you get to run away which is the ultimate privilege that you get to tune it out because most people on the planet do not get to tune out politics. Because politics dictates their lives. What that means is that the politics are currently working in your favour. <laughs> and I guess that you don't like being challenged. But those, those party songs, those love songs, those landscapes aren't going away. Your reality TV isn't going away. Even a game like pick an escapist kind of, maybe a Fortnite, a Fortnite's maybe a very escapist video game, but then what else is a really popular video game? Like Call of Duty. Call of Duty can't possibly not be political. The way that game views the world shines through this fucking gung-ho, rah-rah, American superpower vibe, that's in there. There's like, oh, there'll be, there'll be a couple of scenes here and they'll be like, oh, maybe we're not so good. But in general, you know, that shit, shine, that shit shines through. If you have a worldview, it shines through. And it should be. It should be shining through. You should be putting that into your artwork if you want to make art that actually says something, that art that actually has a proper view of the world. There's nothing to me that uh, is less attractive as a character trait than not caring. They're not giving a shit. I find passion uh, deeply attractive, empowering, inspiring. And I think that obviously it makes your art better. And I think it makes you a better person. <laughs> so put it into your art. Give a shit about the world. Be critical. Embrace your point of view and wear it on your sleeve. Put it out there for people to see. Tapping out is gross and privileged <laughs> as usual jumping around like a fucking dickhead all over the place who knows if I made any uh, irrational points it's something that has been on my mind for years about like putting politics into my art and is it something that I strive to do and yes yes is the answer yes is the answer but it freaks me out. It freaks me out to put it out there. Um, but what I come to realize is that developing a stronger point of view makes the art better. At least to me. Hey, that's the podcast. I hope you got something out of it. Um, do you escape? Do you, <laughs> do you think politics should be kept out of art? And then fuck you. <laughs> Leave a comment below if you, if you disagree, and uh, leave a comment if you do agree, please. Hey, if you like what I'm doing, you can throw me a couple of bucks on Patreon, you know? Pi uh, the price of a pint or the price of a coffee uh, helps me do what I'm doing. Otherwise, don't worry about it. I'm going to continue doing this anyway. I hope you're well. 
stay safe, stay sane. I love you so much. See you next time, baby. Thank you.